1937, Rome celebrates the first anniversary of the new fascist empire. Italy's armies parade past their emperor, King Victor Emmanuel, and his dictator, Benito Mussolini. Mussolini's dream is realized in the revival of Rome's imperial past. The victorious legions march among the ruins of ancient Rome, leading the loyal soldiers of conquered Africa. Red fezed Ascaris from Eritrea, Jubat warriors from Somaliland, Meharisti from Libya.
For years, Mussolini had prepared the Italian people to fight the war that would win him an empire. Italy's ruling fascists needed war and the glory that victory brings. War could solve the inglorious problems of mass unemployment and overpopulation. Mussolini could offer no peaceful solutions. War could mend Italy's crippled economy. Victory could silence opposition more effectively than the state-controlled press. More effectively than rhetoric, a victorious war would truly unite the people behind their Duce. Mussolini's empire grew from the Italian colonies in the deserts of northeast Africa. Libya, Eritrea with its Red Sea coast, and further south, 2,000 miles from Rome, Italian Somaliland. Between these two, tempting Mussolini, Ethiopia, the last independent state in colonial Africa, exposed to invasion on two fronts. Addis Ababa, the city named the New Flower, set among forests of eucalyptus trees on a temperate plateau ringed by deserts and barren mountains. Addis Ababa, remote capital of Ethiopia, at the heart of one of the world's oldest empires. The town's one tarmac road, built for the new emperor's coronation in 1930, spanned by the imperial arch. At 
few motor cars passed under the arch, carrying European diplomats and businessmen. 20th century Europe was slowly invading traditional Ethiopia. One modern hotel had opened, the Greek-owned Imperial. There were two cinemas and one electric generator, but no drains and 150,000 inhabitants. The country's ancient Coptic church was founded 1,600 years ago when Christianity came to Ethiopia. Defender of the Christian faith was the emperor of Ethiopia, claiming direct descendant from the biblical King Solomon and the legendary Queen of Sheba. Ras Tafari, crowned Haile Selassie I, King of Kings, conquering Lion of Judah. Accompanied by bodyguards and servants, Ethiopia's warlords and noblemen would travel from the border regions for an audience with their emperor in his capital. Without the loyalty of these independent feudal rulers, the empire's inaccessible mountain and desert tribes would be beyond Haile Selassie's control. Many would have marched for weeks across hostile country, where nomadic Gala bandits attacked ill-armed travelers on the mule tracks. The city's European population left Ethiopia's static feudal order of life undisturbed. Wealthy citizens still went about their business with an escort of servants. The organization of society had not changed for centuries. Ethiopia remained a very poor country with no modern industry. The fascist government poured both money and manpower into a major rearmament program. Italy was made ready for war. Industry thrived as it built the military machine to crush Ethiopia. By May 1935, Mussolini's aggressive intentions were no secret, but the major powers of Europe just watched. They made no real protest. The Duce's empty threats frightened them. At home, his reputation was rising as unemployment fell and patriotic pride grew. Fascist crowds cheered him through the summer, along the road to war.
Ethiopia's northern and southern borders were threatened by a massive build-up of Italian troops. In Addis Ababa, heart of Ethiopia, the emperor celebrated the Feast of Mascal, the annual ritual marking the end of the long rainy season. This year, peace would end when the summer rain stopped, when the roads were dry and hard, and Italy's invading armies could march towards the capital. Haile Selassie still believed Ethiopia's membership of the League of Nations would protect his country against invasion. New recruits joined the Imperial Guard, the elite of Ethiopia's armed forces, trained in Western warfare by Western advisers. They were dressed in the khaki uniforms of the Belgian army and armed with modern rifles. But they were too few to win a war. War propaganda had revived the heroic Roman legend. A new sense of national identity was being created, uniting all classes, young and old, in the spirit of a fascist adventure. Rumors of war had spread through Ethiopia. Warriors flocked to Addis Ababa to pledge their support to Haile Selassie. The fate of the empire would rest with these fearless, badly armed, barefoot warriors, dressed in their white cotton shamas, marching in the independent armies of the powerful feudal chiefs, the six great Rases. Unwilling to help Ethiopia fight off Italy's colonial threat, the Western industrial nations refused to supply the emperor with arms. The Ethiopians would be forced to meet Italy's machine guns and modern bombers with sticks, swords, spears and 19th century muskets.
Throughout the summer, troop ships left Naples and Genoa, bound for Suez, Massawa, and Mogadishu. The Italian soldiers sincerely believed they were sailing to liberate and civilize Ethiopia. The fascist propaganda machine had worked hard, pounding home a message of warlike, savage Ethiopians, of a society where millions of slaves longed for freedom, a country rich in resources and ripe for invasion. poor and the unemployed were promised a place in the sun with free land and an easy fortune in the conquered empire. The mechanical power of Italy's armory was Mussolini's guarantee of a quick, clean war with few Italian casualties. As the chemical warfare service shipped poison gas to Eritrea, Mussolini promised his soldiers a war without tears. The Red Cross received Queen Elena's blessing and sailed to tend the wounded. Five army divisions disembarked at Massawa. Five divisions of black shirts also landed, looking for glory in Ethiopia. materials flowed steadily from Italian industry to the ports of Massawa and Mogadishu. Boats queued at the docks, waiting to land supplies for the most powerful army Africa had ever seen. 6,000 machine guns, 150 tanks, 700 pieces of artillery, 150 aircraft, and huge supplies of ammunition passed through the docks before the invasion began. During the next six months, the shipments of men and armaments would increase four times. This overwhelming military machine was reinforced by native colonial troops. The Italians fully exploited the region's tribal and religious tensions. In the south, they paid the Muslim Dubak to fight against Christian Ethiopians. In both Somaliland and Eritrea, the courageous Askaris were recruited to the Italian cause and trained as a frontline fighting force for the invasion of Ethiopia. By September, Italian positions were established along the Ethiopian borders. A telegram from Mussolini reached Supreme Commander, General Emilio De Bono in Eritrea. Order you to attack at dawn on 3rd. Repeat, 3rd October. That day at 5 a.m., without declaring war, Italian forces swept into Ethiopia. 
led by the Caproni bombers of the Regia Aeronautica. Among the fascist celebrities who came to win easy honor in the African war were two distinguished volunteers, Il Duce's own sons, Lieutenant Vittorio Mussolini and his younger brother Bruno. drums spread news of the invasion throughout the empire. The warlords and chiefs assembled their tribal armies and marched to Addis Ababa. <laughs> Ethiopia's feudal chiefs were often at war with each other. Now they united to fight off the invaders. Many of them had fought the Italians once before and won. In 1896, Ethiopian warriors had destroyed the Italian army at the Battle of Adowa. They were sure they could humiliate Italy again. Before they set out on the six-week march into the northern mountains, the armies paraded before the emperor in the age-old ritual of Ethiopian war. Ras Mulugeta, hero of Adwa, approached Haile Selassie. Jan Hoy, I was killing Italians before you were born. Now I march into battle once again. I await you on the battlefield. He saluted the emperor and left with his 80,000 men on the long march north. All day, the warriors paraded before the emperor, boasting of their bravery in past battles. But Haile Selassie knew that the invasion had brought a new kind of warfare to Ethiopia. These old battles had been fought in the old way, hand to hand, from dawn to dusk, won and lost in a single day. Listen to Kaki! 
In mid-October, the Lion of Judah left his capital for the imperial city of Harar. At the railway station in Addis Ababa, representatives of the foreign press joined the emperor's subjects and the increasingly anxious diplomatic corps to watch Haile Selassie's departure. This French-built line linking Addis Ababa to the Red Seaport of Djibouti was Ethiopia's only railway. Empress Minen joined her husband on the imperial train. General Vergin, Haile Selassie's Swedish military advisor, was among the well-wishers. On the long journey east, the train stopped to take on water in the barren hills. The emperor scanned the sky. Already there were rumors of enemy aircraft approaching, but the skies were still empty. A telephone call to the palace brought news of the war. Harar was a city Haile Selassie knew well. Like his father before him, he had once been governor of Harar, Ras Tafari. Now, General Graziani's armies were marching north from Somaliland, threatening the southern deserts of Ogaden and Harar itself. The emperor needed the support of the region's tribes to protect the empire.
he returned to Harar to rally support among the Arabic-speaking Islamic chiefs, who owed no loyalty to the Coptic church and the Amharic traditions of the capital. To identify local loyalties with the Empire's war, he laid the foundation stone of a monument to those who died in a bloody border clash with the Italians at Walwal -Wal in 1934. The southern tribes rallied to the emperor's cause. The ritual of war began as the warriors gathered. Since the early 1930s, Italian instructors had trained the Dubat, fiercest of the Somali tribesmen, to fight a war with modern European weapons and traditional Somali ferocity. Graziani ordered them to advance across the disputed border region into the parched desert of Ogaden. General Graziani was a ruthless colonial campaigner, eager for his chance of glory and jealous of General De Bono, who commanded the more important northern front. Graziani moved men and supplies forward across the river Webe Shebele, destroying Ethiopian resistance as he pushed north. He urged Mussolini to authorize a march on Harar.
Only one Italian division had been sent to the southern front. In the north, Graziani's rival, General De Bono, had ten. Graziani was therefore forced into a largely defensive role, protecting the long border positions in the disputed Ogaden against the threat of counter-invasion by the armies of Ras Desta and Ras Nasibu. But Graziani was not content with defense. He had sworn that the Duce shall have Ethiopia with or without the Ethiopians. Caricate, puntate. Attenzione, che stanno vedendo. Mussolini was impatient with De Bono's cautious advance in the north. He insisted on action, and his commander reluctantly ordered the Blackshirts to begin the prestigious march on the undefended town of Macale. Hosanna in excelsis, benedictus qui venit in nomine domini, Hosanna in excelsis. Men and metal received the chaplain's blessing, and the fascist crusade took its civilizing mission south. Santus, Santus. Sanctus Dominus Deus. In nomine Patris, et Fili, et Spiritus Sancti.
Io ne mosso. Come va? When the black shirts reached Macalay on November the 8th, they met no resistance, for the town was governed by Raz Gugza, Haile Selassie's treacherous son-in-law, who had deserted his emperor to join the white-bearded General De Bono. Last time, Ethiopia's warlords and warriors assembled in Addis Ababa. Solemnly, they circled St. George's Cathedral, drawing strength from heaven and the emperor as the invading armies drove deeper into Ethiopia. For the last time, the emperor led the procession around the Coptic church, heart of an ancient Christian tradition threatened by Rome.